If you're not infantry in my family, you sit at the kid's table. John McCain, Carly, still active, first sergeant stationed up before Drum. I've been in 17 years. I'm from southern New Hampshire, um, city right on the border of Massachusetts, Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, grew up there for a little while, uh, then we moved over to the town next next to it, Hudson, and then I went to high school in Merrimack, New Hampshire. Um, childhood was pretty rough until my stepfather came along. Um, so my father was absent most of my childhood. He was in and out, um, doing drugs, running around, not really present. Um, and my mother had gotten into some trouble, and she actually went to prison. So I lived with my grandparents, uh, but my grandfather, a uh, Korean War vet, he, um, he owned a store. He sold Korean War and World War II era, like, uniforms, memorabilia, shit like that. And um, he was on the road a lot. And my step-grandmother, she ran a hair salon out of the house. So when she had customers, she would actually lock me in the basement. So I'd be down there with all his mannequins and, you know, wearing like Nazi uniforms and shit. Oh shit. Yeah. Um, do you know what your why your mom went to prison? Yeah, she um she actually I'll leave out the story side of that on my family. Uh she got set up by someone in my family, but um possession with intent to distribute cocaine to an undercover officer. When my mom came home, we lived uh in an area called French Hill in Nashua. Um a little, little rougher, but uh, I got bullied a lot. Like uh, my brother used to beat the shit out of me. Um, I think most brothers do. And then, you know, my sister was eight years older than me, and her boyfriends used to beat me up. When we moved over to Hudson, um, it didn't stop there. Boyfriends that she would bring home, come and hang out while my mother was at work, used to beat me and my brother up. Stuff. Um, why would they? Why would were they mess with you like that? Uh, we were little kids. And she didn't, she wasn't real protected of you guys, huh? Not that I can remember. Um, yeah, I don't really know why. But she ended up leaving. Um, she got pregnant young, and she moved out with her boyfriend. She since had three kids with him. Oh. Um, but once she left, she wasn't really in our lives anymore after that. Like, just in and out. Like, she was always doing her own thing. Um, and then we moved to a, another neighborhood. My brother, stuck. we lived in a place that actually had some kids that we could uh, hang out with. Uh, there were some older kids in the neighborhood that used to bully my brother and I. Um, just like typical neighborhood shit. And then, uh, yeah, once they, they would always come at us and eventually we started meeting them halfway and they stopped fucking with us. Um, and then we moved to uh, another town where we went to high school. And uh, that was Merrimack. Pretty good town. My brother ended up getting kicked out of high school first. Uh, he was doing all kinds of stuff, not paying attention to class, fighting, whatever. And then he went to an alternative ed school. And then I was right behind him. I got kicked out of school too. Fighting, skipping class, um, just whatever. Just getting in trouble, not paying attention. So... After I did my whole ninth grade year, and then 10th grade is when the principal, Mr. Johnson, was like, it's time to go, dude. So uh, I ended up getting dropping out of school, um, was kind of running the streets a little bit. And then uh, my mom had sent me to Job Corps. I had gotten in trouble. So after it was like my first or second arrest, they were like, you got to do something. So I ended up getting told to go to Job Corps after one of those arrests. When did your uh, stepdad come into the picture? Um, so he came into the picture before we moved to Merrimack. Um, so maybe like sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade, something like that. And then we ended up moving over there and when I was in eighth grade. Um, but he brought structure. Uh, he's a Vietnam vet. Um, he, was, he was a tough dude, um, like stern. You know what I mean? Uh, never abusive or anything like that. The greatest human I've ever met. Um, but he had expectations of me. Uh, my brother left and went to live with my biological father, but my stepdad like 
he made sure I was or he tried to keep me on track the best that he could. Um, by then my brother joined the military. Oh yeah. Yeah. Out of, out of nowhere, my brother joined the army infantry. My grandfather was infantry in the Korean war. My uncle Curtis was infantry. So that was, that was the path. He had to be infantry. Wow. Um, so he actually, he went and I went down to his, uh, basic training graduation. And for the infantry, they got like the Bradleys come out, all kinds of cool shit. Um, so after that, I joined. I joined six months after he did. And then, yeah, uh, infantry was, was the only way to go. So that, so your brother, it sounds like your brother pretty much inspired you to go to the army too? Yeah. He inspired me to do everything, man. Yeah. So I went in, um, I knew the recruiter. The, the first time I had actually spoken to the recruiter was, uh, right after I'd gotten in trouble, I actually called home to talk to my brother and he was like, Hey, I got somebody here. I want to talk to you. I was like, fuck that. I'm not trying to hear it. And, um, so I actually went in after everything, everything I thought was going to work failed. I went in there. I knew what documents to bring. Um, I walked in, told him that I wanted to join. He asked me if I was clean. I said, yes. Um, I actually still had a pending case that uh, he he actually helped me out with it, helped me doing some do some running around to get it closed out. Um, yeah, and I went up to MEPS, rocked the ASVAB. They actually weren't going to give me infantry and told them I wouldn't join unless they did. Um, I got infantry and that was it. What was uh, what what inspired you to want to be infantry and just do that only? If you're not infantry, my family you sit at the kids' table. <laughs> Everyone was infantry, mm. so it, it's really the only option. I went to Bravo Company, 1A Cav. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I was with Ranrod, Diaz, Will, you've met them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I went to 1A. Um, shortly after I got there, I got orders to deploy. So 1A had actually, they were previously Charlie 1-9. Um, so they had, they had gotten back not too long ago. So they had the camaraderie from the deployment and stuff like that. So you drop a couple of replacements in and... They're going to mess with you. They know everything. They've seen everything, that type of stuff, a little hazing here and there. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't too bad because um, when all that shit's over and you're part of the team, they just want to train. They want to train and make sure you're ready because they knew we were going back. Yeah. Oh, man, they used to they'd do all kinds of stuff. They wouldn't have you come down, come down first thing in the morning, boots are shined up. They'll make you do the mountain climbers. Now your boots are scuffed up. So now they got to fuck you up because you're willing. They just like keep it going. Things like that. Um, throw parties. We'll throw, this is a big one. Throw parties. Everybody get drunk and then go the next morning when everyone's hung over. All right, we're doing a five mile. They would do stuff like that. Tactically in the field, that all that stuff was always taken serious. I don't remember any ever really getting hazed like in the field. It mostly just took place in garrison, but I was just showing some love, integrating you into the unit. I say it all the time. I don't think there was a better unit when it comes to camaraderie. Um, there was just something different about Legion. That was the company name. You can you can talk to any of us now. A couple of the officers wrote books, and even in their books, they outline like in all of their experience, Legion Company was just different. Like we were we were so close. Um, it made the losses hurt a lot more. Um, our first one was actually two weeks before we deployed. Um, uh, we called him Nipples. His last name was Andreola. One of the medics called him Areola on accident. So we called him Nipples after that. But uh, Nipples was actually um, Coon's roommate. And we're, you know, I was getting ready to deploy, partying, and he drank too much. And he actually died of alcohol poisoning. But um, like the unit was really close by then. So that was a heavy hit right before we left. Um, so we went to Baghdad. Uh, we were in a place called Rustamaya originally, and then we kind of pushed off. That was when everyone was living in outposts. Mm. So my platoon actually got detached from 1-8, and we got put into 361. So we got put into 2-ID. And uh, so second platoon and third platoon, they went up to uh, Cop Hope. Uh, they kind of established that up there. And then we were working down south in Salmon Park, in the ruins area. Um, and then eventually, after we left uh, 2ID, we came back up into 1-8, and we were 
on the southern side of Sauter City. And what was your experience like there? Um, it was rough. There was a lot of IEDs. Uh, that was the biggest thing. Can't even tell you how many post blast analysis I have when I started doing those. Um, I actually been hit. They they give you a set of words at the beginning of the test, and they ask you it at the end. And those words are apple, elbow, carpet, saddle, bowl. <laughs> I've been hit so many times. I still remember the words. Ironically, um, but it was mostly IEDs. We had. They would hit us with something, and then you know a tick would break out after that. But um, it was just constant. It seemed like it was never ending. Yeah, the first time I was in the back of a Bradley, and we were heading down south. We had just crossed over the bridge, um, crossed so right outside of Rustamaya was the river, and then he crossed over a bridge. We got to the other side. I got hit. Um, the reactive armor did its job. Nothing got in. But that was my first experience with an EFP. It was originally designed for mining. They would blow it and it would it would make progress in the tunnels. But it was um, they'd put copper in the shape of a cone in front of an explosive device, and when the explosive device goes off, the copper then becomes like superheated, and it's a projectile that can cut through armor. Mm. Uh, so that was my first experience with those. Um, had several more. IEDs was my biggest thing. Really? Yeah. Um, do any of them stand out more than the others? Yes. Um, the one that stands out the most is uh, I was in a gun truck and um, Crisanto, uh, so he he was in a Bradley that um, Sergeant Christopher got killed in. Um, they were actually both dismounts filling in, filling some holes on a mounted section and um, an ID came up and killed Caleb and Bob was in the was in the vehicle he was the gunner at the time but um a couple months later maybe not even a couple months it might have been a couple weeks he was set to be back in the lead gun truck and he kind of pulled me aside and was like dude I'm not ready to be in the front yet and I said something stupid like a like an arrogant fucking kid I was like um I'll, I'll take your spot if they're gonna get me they're gonna get me they fucking got me. Um, we crossed over. We crossed over a main MSR. I want to say it was Route Gold, and we came around this corner. There was a school um, pay officers. Remember those? And they were starting to like rebuild the infrastructure. We had actually built a school, or the unit had paid and funded to build this school. They uh, they turned that into a a lookout, and they had set up an explosive. Uh, like a daisy chain um, and they were using it there and I came around we truck got hit the Humvee actually came up sideways like that it was a pretty heavy hit um, they used steel instead of copper which is probably what saved saved our lives um, the glass did its job my squad leader sergeant signed there was there was steel all in his windshield um the seal actually came through and disconnected the gas pedal from underneath my foot. So the gas, the gas pedal just dropped. So somewhere up there, it, it knocked it out. Um, doors wouldn't close anymore. They blew open. It was just completely deadlined. We had to tow it out of the, had to tow it out of the area. Um, but yeah. What did you, uh, when something like that would happen, what was your guys' um, response? We responded uh, ferociously, I'll say. But for in this particular scenario, we actually pulled down uh, the first road on the left. The, the truck had just a little bit of juice left and it got around the corner and it died. Um, and I actually, so there's no need for me to be in the truck anymore. They circled it up. Um, I went to the end of the road and I was a saw gunner. Um, so I came around, I pulled security to the right, and port wine was on the gun. It was on the last gun truck. And um, I, I can't remember if it was pop shots or something. Something happened, and then port wine and I started engaging, and that's when it became clear that they had, they were coming out of the school. Um, yes. tip, that's a typical reaction. Find, find who did it or at least who knew, and uh, respond. 
Were you getting hit with a lot of uh, secondaries? Um, so the unit was, we didn't. So we didn't dismount. Um, there was a lot of, I remember there was a lot of talk about why would we get out? Like, we know. Why would we dismount people? And then um, second with June, they got hit with the secondary and we lost our, our first six guys. So my perspective is a little different because we were still detached at the time. Um, we, were on, we were on the truck line. We were getting ready to leave. And a guy from Alpha Company came up to Crisanto and said, hey, sorry for your loss. And Crisanto was like, what are you talking about? And the guy was like, oh, my bad. And he left. He didn't tell us anything. Um, so we, we rolled out. We got maybe 10, 15 minutes outside the gate. Got got a call on the radio, right between RP time now. So we knew something was wrong. Um, and we got back, and I immediately went to my room. Um, my roommate, Bradley, wasn't on, a, he wasn't on mission that night. And uh, I came through the door, and I like, asked him if he knew what was going on. And he said, yeah, you're not going to like it. I was like, all right, well, just tell me. And he wouldn't say anything. I could see like he was breaking up. And I was like, um, I was like, it was Arnold, wasn't it? And he said, yeah. So I, um, I was very close to Arnold, um, moving closer to deployment. We kind of separated into our platoons, but Arnold was my bunk buddy in basic. So you know, obviously alphabetical order. I was the first B and he was the last A. Um, so we shared a bunk. We were close up until like right before deployment when we started really like winding up for it. But we had four wheelers. Um, we used to go off this uh, Route 2484. Uh, it had a place called Benny's. It was basically just like a big ranch that they let you go. Um, so we took our four wheelers out there. Like we were close. And then, um, but as soon as I could tell by Bradley's reaction that he didn't want to be the one to tell me it was him. And then obviously the other guys were great too. So Sergeant Green's a legend, like all those guys, we really lost the best our unit had in one blast. Wow, man. Um, where was Arnold from? Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah. Um, he, uh, at the time he was, I think they were dating. I don't think he, I don't think he had time to propose. Uh, his girlfriend's name was Sarah. Um, he actually got me into country music. Oh yeah. I only listened to rap before I joined and, um, he had uh, this old red F-150 and he would let me drive it because I didn't have a car. And um, he was like, you can do anything you want. You just can't change my CDs. Okay. So I got in and uh, track number one was write this down. And that was like my first introduction to country music. I don't listen to that song now for obvious reasons, but uh, yeah, that hero flight was tough. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a hero flight. Um, so basically they bought, so Green and, and Leitner actually had survived, so they weren't carried, but um, they carry the bodies from the morgue. The unit lines up on either side and they carry the bodies. We salute them as they go by and they get on the, they put them on the bird to fly them off, off the fob and the birds come up with their lights on and face the unit and they shut the lights off and then they fly away. And it, I don't know what it was. It sucked. It was traumatic. But as soon as those lights like flicked off, it was almost like back to business. My platoon sergeant pulled us aside and was like, this is, this is part of it. It's the worst part of it, but I'm going to ask you to go back out there tomorrow and we, we got a job to do. Caleb was a tough one. Um, that was a loss we took inside the platoon. So um, they split us up. We had, we had a JSS, the, the, the dismounts we stayed at the JSS and then the mounted guys they would do their own missions they lived on the fob they needed access to the mechanics and stuff like that uh, so they were, were basically operating like two separate platoons and um, they had asked to borrow Crisanto and Sergeant Christopher and um, I'm not sure what the circumstances were but they I know they had to go out, um, members of the, of the crews, they'd go out and they pull security, um, on a, 
on the point of origin site or something like that, suspected site to lob mortars. Um, and then when they left, they had actually reversed direction. So when they went in, they weren't the lead vehicle, but when they left, they were. And um, they got hit by an EFP, and that EFP came up to the turret and, and hit Sergeant and Chris. Just killed him. Um, I remember the radio because uh, we have battle roster numbers. So, like for our for me, it was like BXB one four one. Um, so we hear the battle roster number get called off KIA. Ten Sergeant checks the list, knows who it is. Um, that was a rough one. And then we had um. We had Logan. Logan was really close with Sergeant Christopher. Logan, Sergeant Chris was an A second guy. He was just, just all American, right? And then um, Logan wanted to be Special Forces, and they clicked. Um, Logan had the drive that Caleb liked in a soldier. They they lifted together. They did all that stuff. Really mentored him, and um, Logan was in my squad. And um, when that came. When that came down, Logan's reaction was probably the hardest part. Obviously, it hurts for all of us, but when you see, when you see someone like that, and how it hits them, that's the hardest part. Yeah. What uh, what was his response like? Shock at first. Um, obviously, we we're told to RP, and we we're getting ready. We we're we we're getting in the vehicles, and. Uh, just gave him a hug and he cried and that's just like not who he was so those those types of moments make him difficult you know what I mean mm -hmm. yeah. everyone feels the loss but there's certain things that you witness or you see in someone else that really makes it hit hit home even harder what was it like coming back from that um it was tough so we took some losses obviously so coming back without him that was tough um nobody really knew how to greet well back then um the reintegrate reintegration training even from my first to my second was much better um but when we first got back it was basically like just just get them through get them through this reintegration pipeline and then um put them on leave i got 30 days of leave afterwards like everyone does um my hometown just wasn't the same. It wasn't really like, yeah, cool. You went to combat. That's awesome. It's like, it's really not, it wasn't that awesome. But all, like when you leave your hometown, that's what they remember. So the 18 year old John, who all I did was smoke weed and drink, get into fights, whatever. Like they still wanted to do that shit. I just wasn't that guy anymore. Um, some of my closest friends I couldn't even, I couldn't tolerate. Um, I remember drinking the entire time. Um, Do you remember what, what type of things that were, were, were bothering you about them? About my friends? Yeah. The things that you couldn't tolerate? Um, they almost overhyped what I did. Like they... They treated, it was like a, I mean, it's a small town where I went to high school. It's like hometown celebrities. They, they go off to war and they come back. Um, there was three of us. There was myself, my friend Josh, and then my friend Billy. And even to this day, we don't really, like when I go home, I see Josh. I don't really see anyone else. Um, Bill's traveling, doing his thing, but like, we kind of distanced ourselves from the people that we, we were going to the skate park with, we were partying with, because um, they had this thought in their head of what we were when we left, and we just weren't that when we got back. And they almost try to force you to it. Because back then it was like, oh, he's home. Let's let's get back to the old stuff. Let's 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 like throw parties for him and stuff. And I just I didn't want to be a part of it. So that was the main thing that really irritated me. I remember maybe two weeks into my 30 days. I'm like, I just, I want to go back. I just want to go back to Texas. My friends were all in Texas. They were all in my unit. Do you think uh, any of that had to do with them really not being able to understand service 
you know? Uh, yes. Uh, it was also my mindset at the time. Uh, we were young, like we were kids. I, I was 20 years old, right? They were 20 years old. So of course they want to party. Um, I mean, I wanted to party too, but I wanted to party with my boys from one eight. Um, but there was, there's almost this mindset that the veterans and combat vets have like this monopoly on trauma and it's not true. There's everyone had whatever the worst thing that's happened to somebody is like, that's their trauma. So for me, I was like holding it in because I thought, unless you're a combat vet, I'm not talking about it. And that was a mistake that I made back then because my boys had been through some stuff, um, violence, jail, like they had been through their traumas too. But for some reason, when, like when they would go to jail and come home, they wanted to do the partying, right? So that's how they knew how to reintegrate. And uh, I couldn't see that was them trying to help me through my trauma, the only way that they knew how. So at the time, it was an annoyance. But when I look back on it now, it was really just, it was kind of immaturity. Yeah. How long, uh, or where'd you go for your second deployment? Hawija. Um, so I'll, probably like 30 minutes outside of Kirkuk. Okay. Uh, it was a hot spot for the rkg 9s which was basically a, a hang raid like an EFP. So it just blows up and then the metal blows into the vehicle. Um, I only got hit by one IED that deployment, so pretty slow. Um, but I remember, so I wasn't in a leadership position the first time. And I remember like when I got hit, so we listened to music we, we, that, that was how much it changed. Like we were listening to music in the back of the trucks, like headphones and stuff. Um, and, uh, Marty and Jones, those are my dudes. And, um, they got hit by an, an IED and I didn't, like, I noticed it right away. Um, your body kind of reacts. It reacts before you realize what's going on, but I knew the feeling. So like I felt it. And then I see my LT, because we were in the back of the LT's MRAP. He kind of does one of these, and I look at my guys, and I remember thinking, oh, fuck. And then I look, and they're fine. Like, they're barely paying attention. Um, but I remember that feeling like it hits different when you're when you're a leader. There was a lot that happened uh, between that time. Um, we had to had a lot of suicides in the unit. Really? Yeah. Um, so, Crisanto, the one that was... I was in when in the vehicle when Caleb got killed and then I took the blast for him. Um, he ended up committing suicide. Um, we had Jones. Um, I was his team leader slash squad leader of the second deployment. Um, so he went recruiting after I went recruiting and, um, he was like, you know, it's actually a pretty good life. I'm good at it. Um, so I started talking to him and he was on the fence. And I was like, I think you should do it. I think you'd be good at it. Um, the command could use you. Like he was always a motivated guy. Anything he did, he wanted to be the best at it. Um, so he did. Um, he converted. And he went up to be a station commander in Iron Mountain, Michigan. And um, he ended up. So I think they ruled it an accidental death, but he was alone in a bedroom. They said he threw a gun and it shot him in his head. Whatever. I mean, accidental death, whatever. To me, if, to me, it sounds like a suicide. Um, but that loss hit me hard because he might not have been in that room if I didn't convince him to convert 79 Romeo. I don't know the circumstances surrounding it. Um, I never, uh, never reached out to the family. I didn't re reach out to Leanne. Um, I didn't want to know too much. Um, but I remember having the conversation with him about converting when he was on the fence. And I remember him telling me that I made him feel better about the decision and that he was going to follow through with it. And that ultimately led to him being in his next assignment where his, his life ended. 
that was um so that one was that was really tough my biological father so when i was on recruiting in new hampshire my biological father and i we had we had come together around like 16 17 is when we really started getting closer um he came back from florida and he like made an effort to be part of mine and my brother's lives um and then we joined the military but when i came back on recruiting um he had a roommate that needed to move and i needed somewhere to stay so i was getting bah and stuff like that so i was like all right i'll move in with you so we lived together and um he started going down the path of like his old ways drugs um missing work like getting making himself sick basically he was doing so much and um he uh I couldn't do it anymore because what he was doing was he was taking my money and giving it to the landlord and then not paying his. So the landlord approached me and was like, we're like, you're like $2,200 behind. So me, I'm just like, how is that possible? My dad comes clean that he hasn't been paying his portion and he had too much pride to ask me for the money. So I left, I ended up leaving, got my own apartment. Um, and then it just went downhill for him for him from there and um my brother had gotten a house he had an apartment and he had gotten a house and there was only a couch and a bed in it it was my nephew's bed like a small bed um that was all that was in there and my brother was like you got two weeks because then the lease is up but like you can stay there um so my, my father goes in there and uh, i get a call from my brother and he said dad's gone he actually died of a heart attack, massive heart attack, rolled off the bed and died in an empty apartment. The only thing he had was a Corona wallet with nothing in it but a picture of me and my brother in uniform. Wow. Yeah. And that's really what trends it. That's really what made things get bad for my brother. So my brother started, I know he started smoking weed again. That's, that's whatever, but. He was out already? Yeah. So he actually. He left Germany and he went to 10th Mountain. And he got into some trouble in 10th Mountain ultimately ended up getting, deciding that he didn't want to stay in the army, whatever. So he got out of the army and um, he had, uh, he started picking up drugs after like doing pills, oxys, um, some other stuff. And then it started getting really bad, right? right around the time that his daughter, my niece Ava was born. And it got to the point where we were in the VFW one night and my mother actually had it out with him because she recognized the drug use in him. Um, he got defensive, got in a fight. He actually ended up throwing an ashtray at my stepfather. Um, and I think the last thing he said to my mother is I fucking hate you. And he left the, he left the VFW. Um, two weeks later, 10.30 at night, I get a call from my mother. Say, your brother's unresponsive. It's not good. Come now. So I get out of bed. Um, my wife's with me. And she's in the passenger seat. I'm driving from Manchester to Nashville. It's like a 20-minute drive from my apartment to his. And I'm, I'm flying. And I was obvious. I was bawling, right? About halfway there, I like took a deep breath, stopped crying, looked at my wife and I said, he's gone. Like I felt it, I felt him die. And she was like, no, he's gonna be fine, he's gonna be fine. We get off the exit, uh, we pull into the the parking lot and uh, my wife's phone rings. So, uh, I mean, I already know that's not good. And um, my mother told her that he passed they tried to use the Arcan on him, nothing worked. It was uh, fentanyl. My mother to this day, I didn't even drive all the way up. I, I stopped and got out of my car. It was a manual transmission. I didn't even put it in neutral. I let the clutch pop and got out. Like, I didn't know what, I didn't know what to do. My mother to this day said that my scream is like the most gut-wrenching thing she's ever heard. When he was in Ramadi, his best friend Jeff got killed. Um, he was never the same after that. We're very close to the family. Um, Adrian actually is an infantryman right now. He's deployed. 
Um, and the middle brother, Stephen, is a Afghanistan veteran. Um, but anyway, yeah, my brother was really close to Jeff. And when Jeff and Tribble got killed, it, it flipped his world upside down. Um, he couldn't assimilate in 10th Mountain. Like, he just wanted to go back to Germany. Couldn't happen. Started getting into trouble. Um, and then when he transitioned out, he actually had a shoulder injury and got some work done to his shoulder and just over, over prescribing pills to him. Um, couldn't get pills anymore. He, he chased it down other ways. But uh, I think the big thing for him is he just didn't have anybody. He didn't have anyone to talk to, which, um, that's shitty to say because I lived the next town over when he did it. I was just going to ask if he's ever had the discussions with you, but I mean, just from you saying that, it sounds like he might not have been open with you. No, he was. Um, so, so two weeks before, two weeks before he passed, he sent a text to me and said, yeah, I'll just take a 30. I responded. I said, like, what are you talking about? Um, he said, oh, my bad. I'm, I'm trying to get weed. I was trying to buy weed. That's, I'm, I'm smoking weed again. I'm like, I've done a lot. I, I've had a lot of involvement with weed. Nobody asked for a 30, right? They asked for perk 30s. Um, so he was like, all right, I'm going to come over after work. I'll talk to you. So he comes up and incredibly high, like almost unbelievably high that he even drove. And he said, I'm really struggling with the loss of dad. I'm just like, all right, well, what can I do? Um, he said he wanted to spend more time with me. Obviously agreed to do that. Um, we were going to, uh, we we're going to start lifting together and, um, uh, never happened. And then overdosed. The, now this conversation was just two weeks before that incident. Yeah. So we had that conversation and then, um, a day or two later, he had the fight at the VFW with my parents. And um, he was texting me. I actually recently lost the text, um, but he was texting me because I was actually on orders to go to Colorado. So I was getting ready to leave. And um, he sent me a picture of his daughter. He said, it sucks, you're not going to be around for a growing up. That text was just after 8. I have to call at 10.30. And now I'm the one that's around. How's she doing? She's good. Um, so, she's got a great mother. Um... Her, my brother's widow married um, a guy named Colin. He's a great guy, hard worker, built a business from the ground up, a fencing business, like providing so much for them. The kids had it great. Um, it's obviously still not the same, but all all things considered, the kids have a great life, and they got two great parents. So that's great. That's good to hear. Yeah. I mean, it's tough on my mother. Um, so my stepfather actually passed away too. Oh. Yeah. So my, my biological father died 2012, brother 2015, stepfather or the man that I call my dad 2018. Um, my grandfather died shortly after him. So my mother lost every man in her life except me in about a five year span. Wow. How did your stepfather die? Um, so you got AL amyloidosis um, from Agent Orange in Vietnam. Wow. How's your mom doing? People grieve different. Um, I have conversations with her about her lifestyle, um, but I also understand that I'm not there. So she maintains her house. It's always spotless. She's got a great group of friends, a lot of support. Uh, my family's big in the hometown of BFW. 
she's got a lot of support um she spends a lot of time out socially with friends and sometimes i disagree with that but i also understand that being home alone talking to walls probably isn't the best thing either you're still active duty i am active duty first sergeant that's why i was nervous to come on here man yeah um it's interesting because, right, we, we use, I usually get into transition at, at this point and stuff, and you were able to discuss your brother's transition, um, that unfortunate uh, transition out. But um, I'm curious, you know, with all the loss that you've endured, um, you know, through combat, family, uh, you know, how do you, do you think staying active duty kind of helps you deal with that? The big thing for me is the suicides. Um, obviously, it's terrible to lose the eight guys we lost on the first deployment. Um, my family passing, that stuff's, that stuff's hard, but the suicides are the ones that get me the most. Um, and we have Fort Wine. Uh, that one's hard because I missed a call from him the night, the night before. So those are the ones that are hard to deal with, but then you start... Um, you start meeting other people with similar stories and it seems like there's more people to relate to and to help out in the military. Um, I have, I have a guy in my unit right now, um, technically a subordinate, but probably one of my closest friends, loss of a brother. Um, he, it's been tough for him mentally. Um, combat guy, uh, if a tremendous ranger, deployed with 10th mountain like 82nd like he's done it all and um it's connections like that that have made it easier for me um or at least helped the maturity process like i said like we don't have a monopoly on trauma um but military friends is the ones that have worked for me it does the army do anything uh uh for transitioning um, you know, to, 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 to reintegrate, uh, you know, back into civilization or, you know, being a civilian again. Yeah. It's actually up to two years now. Um, it's called SFL tap, uh, soldier for life. Um, so there's actually a whole process so that guys aren't just like, here's your DD 214 good luck. They do resume building. They do everything. Um, getting people on LinkedIn, getting people into uh, internships. You can actually do the last six months of your uh, career on an internship. So the Army will still pay you, but you get to transition into civilian life with the financial stability that comes from being in the military. Um, as far as behavioral health goes, it's a lot better than, you know, your, your time, my early times. Like, there's access to it. Um, I think the system's a little taxed right now. I might get in trouble for saying that, but I don't think it should take six to eight weeks for someone to get seen by behavioral health. Um, fortunate, fortunately for me, I reached out to uh, someone at brigade at my brigade headquarters that deals with behavioral health, and he got me a civilian referral. Mm. Uh, the, but the stuff's out. The support's out there. If someone has an emergency they're going like they're going they're going to get treated um my friend that i just told you about he actually got he got they sent him to inpatient and i was one of the people he chose to continue communicating with while he was in inpatient and it, it, i think it changed his life i really do um he's closer to retirement like i am um but and that support's out there throughout your career and when you're getting near the end. Um, veterans were always there to support me, um, but I have some great civilian friends that have been through trauma unrelated, obviously, to combat, and their coping skills work just as well for me. So I do I do think it's important that we just, just find a network of people that care, and they're out there. And suicide doesn't, that's, that's not the way to go. Because when somebody commits suicide... The, the pain doesn't go away. It just gets transferred to someone else. You just transfer your pain to someone else. And then you also like, when you lose somebody, it's like a piece of your soul dies with them. 
I'm like, you don't get that back. You just learn to live with less. And I just wish that some of these people would call me or call somebody that can not keep killing themselves because I don't have much soul left. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. call me, I'll help you. Well, shit, John, we're going to get ready to wrap it up, brother. All right, man. It's been a little over an hour. <laughs> Go like that. Really? Yeah. Um, but before I do, uh, before I get to tape, man, any last words? I don't really have anything prepared for like a, a closing statement or something, but what I just said, how, how we finished that, call someone. And if no one's told you today, you fucking matter. Thanks for being here, brother. Appreciate it. No problem, man. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more.